Over the years, many stories and interviews have been widely circulated concerning Jesus being the only way to heaven. You've had figures like Oprah denying that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There's clips of figures like Steve Harvey saying, there's no one way to heaven, no one way to paradise. And there's also that infamous Larry King and Joel Osteen clip where Osteen does not clearly state or declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, in this present day, can you just imagine someone standing there on an international stage and declaring that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Can you imagine someone of influence, a wealthy businessman, a prominent politician, or perhaps even a president or prime minister saying that? Imagine the headlines and the media fallout. In the Bible, just before Jesus was taken to heaven, he said to us, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. But since this instruction, what has happened? Have Christians embraced the Great Commission? Here's what Pew Research says, and I quote, The religious profile of the world is rapidly changing driven primarily by differences in fertility rates and the size of youth populations among the world's major religions, as well as by people switching faiths. Over the next four decades, Christians will remain the largest religious group, but Islam will grow faster than any other major religion if current trends continue by 2050." End quote. This is alarming to the Christian community. This should make you weep. Have you been preaching the gospel? If you look at America, the percentage of American adults who identify as Christian has been declining each year, while the percentage of those who do not identify with any religion has been rising rapidly. Right around 2010, the share of Americans who were Christians dropped below 75%. By 2021, the General Social Survey reported that the share of Christians had declined to 62%. In just the last five years, the share of Americans who are Christians dipped below 50%. At the same time, it's said that around 28% of Americans identify with no religion as of this year. This shows a deep decline and a serious cause of concern for us as Christians. It only points to one fact. We've not been performing our Christian duties. The big question we need to ask ourselves is why this is happening. Are Christians not preaching the gospel? Is the spirit of Antichrist getting stronger by the day? Well, I believe there are four reasons for this. The first reason is a lack of knowledge. How often have you heard the gospel in a sermon, book, or conversation? If you've been a Christian, even for a short time, you have likely heard the gospel hundreds of times. Yet many of us still struggle to articulate the truths of the gospel in a simple, coherent, and intelligible way. Could you share the essential message of the gospel in 60 seconds right now? Many Christians can't do this, and that's tied to one reason. We have not truly studied and taken the time to learn the gospel in preparation for when we come across unbelievers. The second reason is that some of us don't care much about lost people. We would never say it, but our priorities and lives reveal it. We make no time in our busy schedules to interact and engage with those who don't know Christ. We have long stopped praying for lost people in our neighborhoods and workplaces. We do not have the courage to share the gospel with non-Christian friends or acquaintances. When was the last time you invited someone into your home who did not know Christ and shared the gospel with them? When was the last time you consciously prayed for lost souls? This is a significant assignment that Christ gave to us. If we will truly show His light, we must be ready to make soul winning our priority. The third reason is fear. Many Christians ask questions like, what will others think of me? What if they don't like me or my family? Some are paralyzed by the thought of being disliked, marginalized, laughed at, or openly mocked. We're afraid we'll lose business or get passed up for that promotion. What if they stop inviting my kids to birthday parties? What if talking about Christ makes seeing my neighbors awkward? These so many what-ifs are leading men to hell. 
Luke 9 verse 26 says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. These are words straight from Jesus' mouth. Will you smile if Jesus denies you on the last day? How will you feel if he tells you that he doesn't know you after all your tithes and offerings on earth? You need to know today that God's heartbeat is soul-winning. While your tithes and offerings are crucial, they do not equal your evangelical service. Silence the fear. Share the gospel. The fourth and final reason is that too many of us have a lack of compassion for the lost soul. We have long forgotten what it was like to live without hope, to be lost and far from Christ. We rarely consider what the Bible says about those who do not obey Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 says, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. However, do we care that much? We might say we care, but we rarely cry out to God for the salvation of our lost neighbors, co-workers, and classmates. God is reminding us of what to do again. We need to have compassion for lost souls. You need to remember that the only way to God is through Christ. That means anyone outside Him does not even know the Father. By now, we need to know how we can fulfill this Christian duty. First, we need to remind ourselves of what the Gospel says. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul reminds Timothy of the Gospel's truth in order to encourage him to press on and be faithful to the message entrusted to him. If Timothy, a student of Paul, a faithful servant, a pastor, preacher, and teacher needed to be reminded of the truth of the Gospel to keep going, how much more do you and I need to be reminded of the eternal truths of the Gospel? Much of this reminder happens when gathering together with fellow believers. As God's people recall His truths, week to week in homes and gathered together in worship, we combat the forces that are set to silence the gospel in our nation by reminding one another that God's mission is to save sinners through the work of His Son, Jesus. As we preach and continue to preach the gospel to ourselves and to one another, will be more prepared to speak it afresh to those without Christ. A Christian man was on his deathbed. As he lay there, his family by his side, the room was silent. The only sound was the heart rate monitor machine beeping slowly in the background. He summoned the strength to give his loved ones some parting words. He said, the Bible warned me that time is short and I didn't listen. The Bible warned me that it profits nothing for a man to gain the whole world, but lose his soul. For over half my life, I worked and worked. I accumulated possessions, but no amount of money I've made could buy me another 24 hours on this earth. The Bible warned me to forgive, but I carried so much anger against so many people who had done me wrong. It is only in my final days that I have been able to forgive. Don't be like me. Listen to God's warnings early enough to take action. Don't wait until it's too late. It was almost too late for me. Now, when I heard this story, it made me think, how many of us underestimate biblical warnings? How many of us take biblical warnings seriously? Now, the Apostle Paul is a fascinating character in the Bible. Before he was Paul the Apostle, he was known as Saul from Tarsus. He was originally a Pharisee and a persecutor of early Christians. Saul was a zealous Pharisee who was determined to stamp out what he saw as a dangerous heresy that was spreading in the Jewish community. This Saul would go door to door and beat Christians. And it's believed that he also killed them. In the book of Acts, the first person to die for following Jesus was a man named Stephen. Stephen gave a speech about Jesus and called everyone to repent and trust in Jesus. At the end of the speech, Stephen is stoned to death. It says of Saul in Acts 8 verse 1, And Saul approved of his execution. At the least, Saul approved and was happy with the execution. At the most, 
he set up the execution. Saul killed followers of Jesus. But despite all of this, Saul had a dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus, where he saw a vision of Jesus. And after this experience, the one persecutor of Christians became a Christian himself. Now, let me ask you, was Paul so bad that God couldn't use him? Of course not. Paul was transformed when he encountered Christ. And when Paul did encounter Christ, he wrote many books in the New Testament. And there's one passage of scripture where he gives us six cautionary warnings regarding how we live our lives. These six warnings are, don't participate in the darkness of wild parties. Don't be involved in drunkenness. Have nothing to do with sexual promiscuity. Do not live immorally. Do not be found quarreling. And the last point is not to be jealous. Now, these six points can be found in Romans 13, verse 13, where the Bible says, Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness, or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living, or in quarreling and jealousy. When Paul says, don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness, the imagery here is powerful. Imagine a person stumbling around in the dark, unable to see clearly. In the same way, engaging in wild parties and drunkenness clouds our judgment and leads us into spiritual darkness. Just as a lighthouse warns ships of dangerous rocks, the Bible cautions us about the perils of indulging in activities that dull our spiritual senses. The next couple of points are to do with guarding against sexual promiscuity and immoral living. Continuing in Romans 13, verse 13b, Paul urges us not to participate in sexual promiscuity and immoral living. The combination of sexual promiscuity and immoral living are like a thick fog that obscures our vision of God's plan for our lives. Such behaviors breed an ungodly attitude, ungodly habits, and eventually, it becomes a lifestyle. This is why it's incredibly important to be rooted in God's Word. Much like a compass points true north, the Bible provides a moral compass that, when followed, guides us away from the fog of immorality. In Romans 13, verse 14, Paul provides us with a solution as he writes, Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothing ourselves with Christ is like putting on a suit of armor. It protects us from the arrows of temptation and shields us from the allure of worldly desires. Just as a soldier prepares for battle by putting on armor, we prepare for the spiritual battles of life by clothing ourselves with the character and teachings of Christ. As we navigate the challenges of our time, let us heed these warnings, guarding against the pitfalls that lead to spiritual darkness. Now, I would like for us to further explore warnings from Paul the Apostle, and one of his most serious warnings to Christians is related to unbelief. Hebrews 3 verse 12 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. This is a serious warning because Paul is telling us that we need to see to it that none of us have a wicked and unbelieving heart. A heart which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord. A heart that turns away from the living God. And let me show you just why unbelief is so crippling to a Christian. In Matthew 13, when Jesus was coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in the synagogue and verse 58 says, Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Think about that. Jesus didn't do any miracles because of unbelief. Jesus didn't perform any mighty works because of unbelief. And so, my friends, 
You see why Paul warns us against having an unbelieving heart. When you have a heart filled with unbelief, you deny God's power. You deny God's glory. You deny the Lord of all that he is. So be warned, people of God. See to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Now for this next warning, I have to give you a little bit of context before I go on any further. The children of Israel were led out of captivity and slavery. They saw incredible miracles from God. They saw the Red Sea was parted. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. They were fed by manna from heaven. But despite seeing God's strong hand, the children of Israel rebelled, murmured, and complained against God. And so Paul in the New Testament warns us in Hebrews 3, verse 15 to 17, as has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? The warning here is that we should not harden our hearts. Don't be cold and insensitive to the voice of God. In the midst of all the chaos and confusion of this world, the voice of God is still calling out to us. The Spirit of the Lord is knocking on our hearts. A hardened heart means that someone is blind. It means insensitivity towards God's beauty and glory. It means chasing after our own desires instead of the things of God. But thankfully, in His mercy, God has offered to change our hearts. God can change our hearts. The third warning I believe we should be aware of can be found in Hebrews 2 verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. Now, I believe that the Amplified Translation explains this verse further as it says, For this reason, that is, because of God's final revelation in His Son Jesus and because of Jesus' superiority to the angels, we must pay much closer attention than ever to the things that we have heard, so that we do not, in a way, drift away from truth. In essence, what the Bible is telling us here is that we should be careful not to drift away from the truth that is Jesus Christ. We should be careful not to slip away from the truth of the gospel. Because in this world, you will encounter people who give you their own watered-down version of the gospel. People who will preach a gospel that will require no repentance, no commitment. No denying of self, but instead a gospel that tickles the ears. It sounds good, makes you feel good, but has no power to transform you or challenge you. This is what we should be careful about. Let's not drift away from the truth of the gospel. The real gospel of Jesus Christ will challenge and convict you. It will lead to a change in your sinful habits and cause you to repent. And we should do just that, saints. We should repent and turn away from sin. Romans 6 verse 1 to 2 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? In this scripture, Paul tells the early church that we should not sin as much as we want just to get grace. We have been set free from sin, so how can we choose to still constantly live in it? In the same way that a child follows his father's rules out of love for him, we should follow our heavenly father's rules out of love for him. 
Satan will try to get us to believe the doctrine that tickles our ears instead of the true gospel of Christ. We must take the time to examine our own life. There is a serpent in your garden trying to convince you to sin. Who is that serpent masqueraded as? Maybe it's a friend, co-worker, or a loved one. Take a moment to reflect on who Satan could be using in your life. After that, think about what lies Satan is trying to get you to believe. Maybe it's that God doesn't love you or that God doesn't care if you sin. Those are lies. Now, after you identify who the devil is and what lies he is trying to get you to believe, run to the serpent killer. After Adam and Eve give in to sin, God lays out his punishments for Satan, Adam, and Eve. When talking to the serpent in Genesis 3, he says that an offspring of Eve will come and step on the head of the serpent. By doing this, the offspring will kill the serpent. Many years later, one of Adam and Eve's offspring came to live on this earth. His name was Jesus. By his life, death, and resurrection, he defeated Satan and stepped on the serpent's head. Take time now and ask for protection from the one who defeated the serpent.